allows me people to Facebook cell phones. I never done call you guys. Juan Cagón from Massachusetts, Majima Village. Welcome to the Juan Cagón Show. Today we have a special guest, Milana Rodrigues, uh, who is uh, the author of For the Love of Portuguese Food, right? It's because I got a background, but it's like this. <laughs> Milana, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So obviously the Juan Cagón Show is... It's interviewing interviews that showcase other people in our community and uh, to show everyone's background, what they do. And so for our viewers who maybe they, I'm sure they're probably familiar with your cookbook, but for your personal background, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are, your family, your kind of your Portuguese background, if you will. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I actually am American born. Um, a lot of people think I was born in Portugal, but no, I was born here in Gloucester, Mass, actually. Uh, we immigrated to Gloucester because I had an uncle there. My mother's brother, he immigrated there first. And then um, my mom and dad came over and my dad was a fisherman. So Gloucester had a small fishing port and there's a Portuguese community there. So we fit in nicely there. And then we moved to New Bedford. Um, but my parents started sending me to Portugal uh, at the age of one. One and a half was my first trip to Portugal. And um, I've been addicted since then. I, I loved it. My sisters were older than me. They actually were born in Portugal. They um, were 12 and 13 when I was born. My mother, when she immigrated to America, she thought she was done having kids. And then she found out she was pregnant. So it was a little bit of a shock. Um, but it ended up being a good thing for her because my sisters got married. When I was about six, they got married two weeks apart and they stayed in Portugal. So it was like, it was kind of hard for my parents. Um, so then I was my mother's little companion while my dad was out fishing. So it all worked out. And, uh, but I was a big surprise. <laughs> and, uh, but um, we, we established this life in New Bedford and, you know, there's a Portuguese community here and I love New Bedford. I've always, I've tried to move away a few times and I always miss the, the Portuguese culture. It's ingrained in me. And um, I think, you know, going back to Portugal every year was a big deal for me. And I, I try to maintain that now with my kids. My, my husband is also Portuguese. And um, so we still have a very strong connection. We go back every summer. We bring my daughters back. Their first, first trips to Portugal were also at the age of one. And, um, you know, I'm grateful that my parents brought me up Portuguese. I was always very, very proud to be Portuguese, even at a time it wasn't really popular to be Portuguese. Everyone wanted to be more Americanized. And I, I've always been, you know, happy to go there and um, to speak Portuguese and to just learn everything that I can about it. And of course the food, the food is um, a big part. And uh, you know, when you grow up Portuguese, we get, we're lucky we have our moms make us the wonderful homemade meals. I grew up with a lot of seafood um, cause my dad was a fisherman. He'd come home with fresh fish all the time. Uh, he'd salt his own cod. So my house is, I don't know if you, because you're from Attleboro, but if you grew up in New Bedford, there was a time, you don't see it now, but all the fishermen would have cod hanging on their clotheslines. <laughs> and um, I lived like in a very busy, like area near the beach. So my mother's driveway was right there and there'd be cod hanging. It was a little bit embarrassing, <laughs> you know, but, um, <laughs> instead of clothes, you had cod drying, but I mean, it was wonderful. We had wonderful cod, you know, salted by my dad. And now I buy the cod salted already. I don't salt it myself, but we used to get it for free. So, you know, they would take advantage of it. And um, so I actually, when I lived at home with my parents, I didn't cook very much because I was too busy working. I used to work near Boston. And so my parents would be nice enough to have dinner on the table for me, even wash the dishes for me because I'd get home late. But um, I became interested in cooking more like after I got married and then I got laid off. Um, several years ago when I had my second daughter and then I uh, just got into cooking more and um, then I had this idea that um, it'd be nice to write a book in Portuguese, um, a Portuguese cookbook in English of Portuguese foods and because uh, I realized one day that there weren't too many out there. I went looking for one to do like a raffle um, and I couldn't find any because I wanted to put like a basket, a Portuguese basket together and uh, there weren't too many books. So um, I was like, oh, you know, it'd be nice to do. And, but many years went by and I did nothing. And my friends would joke with me and ask me like, how's that book coming along? And I just wasn't working on it. So then I finally started the, the Facebook page for the Love of Portuguese Food. And um, the response was overwhelming. People loved the recipes because it brought back 
a lot of memories. And, uh, you know, certain dishes, they, you know, called vir, reminds you of your grandmother or your mother. And um, so it kind of motivated me even more. And then eventually I put together uh, the book. It's basically a compilation of the recipes I already had shared on Facebook. And um, took me a little while to put together. And uh, eventually in 2017, I, um, I launched it. And uh, it's exciting. It's very exciting. Yeah. You know, Could you tell it? Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about, because uh, I know you said you went to Portugal when you were one, but could you tell us maybe the first trip where you actually remember and what was most memorable to you on that trip? Um, what I remember, um, I remember bits and pieces of like when I was a child, I remember um, with my sisters, um, one of my sisters, like they got married and they stayed there, both of them, but then one came back and one stayed there and I'd go and spend the summer with her. And I remember her, um, a lot of, I have a lot of different memories with her. She'd send me to the Merceria, the little store next door, um, cause she didn't want to go. So I'd go and, but I, and she'd have the little conta, you know, I didn't have to take money. They'd be like, oh, put the, I go get some ham, some fiambre and caju, met, met na conta. And then like yeah. they would, um, everything up on the little piece of paper on the counter and then they write it in the book and um, I always got myself a little chocolate you know because I loved the Gina chocolates and uh, I always so that's one of the fond memories I have um, another memory I have is sitting at the cafe um, I don't know what age I can't remember exactly what age I started remembering but I was very small and uh, my sister would go and sit there for hours with her friends and um have their bikas, but I I couldn't have an espresso, you know. So I'd order the carioca de limão, which was the little um, lemon tea. With it have like the little slice of lemon in there, and then I'd have my little. It'd be the same same little cup as the espresso, and I'd have and have that and just sit there with them. And I thought I was all you know cool, you know, living the European lifestyle. I loved it. I just loved it. Um, I also remember is my grandmother um, making me take naps after lunch. <laughs> um, I, didn't have a, <laughs> I didn't like that very much. Like I'd have lunch and then she'd make me go like, I can picture that. And I remember she had a panico. Do you know what the, the little? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. She had, she had a little, the nightstand and I had like a little door and in there she had a little panico, um, and uh, which is a little potty. Uh, Cause back then her house did have a bathroom and it was outside of the house still, uh, but very close, very close to the front door. But her house was still, you know, one of those. And um, she had the little niku near the bed. I remember that. And then she used to make me um, sopas uh, the cafe, where she would um, she would make me coffee. I was a kid, and I she'd serve me coffee for my order of the lunch. I guess that's I love my order of the lunch. I love my coffee with something sweet. And I must have gotten that from my grandmother because ever since I was little, she would make me like a big cup of just like regular coffee. And then she'd have the bread and I would soak it in there. And it was so delicious. And then she used to make me um, jmalaj. Do you know what that is? No, um, not often. Did you ever have that? It's the egg yolk with sugar. She used oh. to um, make me, I think because I was like really thin and she, I think she needed like, she felt like she needed to like, that and forza <laughs> and fat me up. Yeah. And uh, she'd make me jamadas, which was with an egg yolk with sugar. And like, oh, you okay. just beat it. And then I would eat that like that or like on bread. And it was so delicious. Um, I remember sitting on her couch um, and her having the Sandman port wine on her um, buffet in the table and um, things like, there's just so many memories. I remember going uh, dressed up in Saint Juan one year. Um, they'd have the Festa de Saint Juan, have the bonfires, and um, I got to go dressed up holding the sign uh, one year. That was fun. And uh, then they'd have the, what they call the Banyu Santo, which is they go swimming at four o'clock in the morning. But I remember I was young and I remember I just slept in the car. My sister went off to the beach at like four in the morning, you know, for the swim. And I, I just, I have tons and tons of memories going up to the Serra. We have a mountain in Figueira de Foz. And people would go up there, bring a hammock, um, and then you'd have like a sardinada up there. And a lot of things were involved, food and uh, just good times, you know. And uh, I just have so many fond memories. I could go on forever and ever talking about all the different things I did, you know, as a kid. And then as I got older and um, the 
the funny thing is, you know, my parents, they kind of instilled this love for Portugal in me, you know, by sending me there. And um, I even, I got to a certain age that my mother said, you know, that's it. I'm not paying for your trips anymore. If you want to go, you have to pay yourself. So I would work um, through my school year in high school and uh, save up all my little dollars and I'd pay for my trip. I'd book it and I'd have like $500 for like two months for the whole summer. And, um, and I would go, you know, and um, even when my parents didn't want to send me anymore, it was just like, I went on my own. I'd bring my friends and, um, you know, I have very, very fond memories of it. Like I said, I could go on and on and on and on, you know, but sure. I don't have the exact age that I, my first memory, but I have so many. Yeah. What was it like? Uh, what were some of your favorite meals that you had there cuisine wise? What were some of the favorites? Um, the meals that I like there, I loved, um, always loved the majwaj abonyong patu. And um, I remember going out to eat with my parents. Uh, I always would order the majwaj. But like here we have those little necks that we use to make it. It's like a thicker shell. There would be like a white thinner shell and they were just so delicious. And I, it was like different types of clams that I couldn't have here. So I loved having those there. So I'd have that with um, the French fries. I was addicted to French fries. I still am. I try not to have them as often now because, you know, you got to be a little bit smarter. But, um, Story of that, my life. <laughs> yeah, that was, um, oh my gosh, homemade for me. Like, that's how I would measure, like, if a restaurant was good. The batata frita, if it wasn't kazaida, if it wasn't homemade, then, you know, it wasn't up to par. Like, the, the French fries had to be homemade. Now, a lot of people tend to use the, um, the frozen, but... You, you still can find the, the hand cut ones, which I love, but those were like my favorites, the, the French fries. And then um, I'm very much into sweets. Um, so I love chocolate mousse. I just remember everywhere I went, I would ask for, you know, do you have chocolate mousse? Do you have chocolate? Is it, is it homemade? Is it homemade? And um, I, uh, when I would go out with my friends, um, I was in my twenties already. Like we would hang out till like, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning to go before we go to the club, we used to go to this restaurant and they would let us like hang out in the back and my friends would drink and I would have chocolate mousse. They used to make fun of me because I would sit there and they'd be drinking because I'm not much of a drinker. And I'd be like, well, bring me another mousse. I'd have like two, you know? <laughs> and uh, those are my favorites. <laughs> and of course, Sardinhas. Um, ever since I can remember, like having a Sardinhada because I'm from Figueira, like we get the Sardinhas fresh. Like you can go to the, the Lata and get them fresh and um, the fish auction. And um, it was just a family thing. Like someone would go buy the fresh lettuce and um, boil some potatoes. And we do the, the sardines on the charcoal grill and lay everything out. When my grandparents were still around, we'd have it in their yard and they had the grapevines above. And, you know, we have a nice sardinada. Um, and after they left, then my sister built a house and we have it at her house. I have a condo, so it's, you can't really grill sardines there, but we do it at my sister's house. And, um, it's usually like our first meal when we get to Portugal, like it's our welcome to Figueira. So definitely, you know, involves a lot of the seafood. Um, some other wonderful dishes that I love from Figueira, the Faja, Masada de Marisco, which um, it's a seafood pasta instead of a seafood rice. It's with macaroni and um, it's absolutely wonderful. And um, the migas from that area also, it's uh, like cornbread and, and the black eyed peas and greens mixed into it. Um, those are probably some of my favorites that you can have over there that I like, that I've liked since I was young. Now you've been able to see the cuisine in Portugal, uh, cuisine here within Portuguese restaurants and who made. Can you tell us a little bit about the differences, if there are any differences in um, you know, the, the actual mainland versus the Portuguese restaurants here in New England? Um, I think they do a good job of, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, they do a very good job. And honestly, to be very, very honest, um, nowadays, like when we used to go out to eat in Portugal, you couldn't eat a bad meal. Like there was a time it was like being at a relative's house eating. But in the last more recent years, I think because of maybe costs are so expensive um, and they're not using as many as much maybe olive oil or um maybe not as good ingredients. And also because of the tourism, I think the quality of the food, like you might go to a restaurant and it's not like what it used to taste like. Like that's what I'm finding. And I've talked to people that have gone for many years and you find that now before, like you could go to any restaurant and just 
eat incredible food. Um, so, but here, like, I feel like they maintain like the traditional more like these Portuguese restaurants and um, where they're like, things are kind of changing. So I think a lot of the restaurants do do a good job here of, um, you know, maintaining the traditions and making the foods taste like what they should. And, um, but I'm finding that that change in, in Portugal and I hope it doesn't change too much. And if you do ask the locals there when you go out to eat, they also always say, stay away from like, obviously the touristy restaurants, you know, go to the, you know, the, the adega, the tashkas, um, those are like the little mom and pop places. That's where um, you can eat the best. But I think a lot of the restaurants here, like they, they're pretty, pretty good on the market. There's a few, you know, that have a more Americanized twist to it. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think there's, they do a good job, you know, very close to what it should taste like. Yeah, that's something I never had the chance to do. Like, what, so when I visit, it's always, you're always at family's house. We jump in our family to family. That's, yeah, 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 I hear you. That happens to us, like, when we go to Lisbon, like, sometimes people ask me, like, oh, what are some good restaurants in Lisbon? And I really don't eat out much in Lisbon because we, we usually just spend a couple of days, the last two days, and I have my sister-in-law there. So she wants us to eat at home with her. So I'm not going to be like, well, we're going to go out to eat, you know? So I don't get to eat out too much in Lisbon. In Figueira, we've eaten out a lot because there was actually, when I'm there on vacation, it's not for me to cook. Like I'm on vacation, you know, even like I have my own place, I have my own kitchen, but it's, I'm not there to cook. I'm on vacation. So I don't want to be cooking. So we used to eat, I don't do it anymore though. We used to eat out like every single night. So we knew a lot of the restaurants there and I'm finding a difference there definitely in, in the food and some of the places they're just um, some of the places start gearing more towards the tourists then you know when they do that like something gets lost so we try to find the more like mom and pop you know tashkas or degas to eat at even when we go places we always ask the locals i'm like what's a good place to eat you know like away from like the touristy popular restaurants and hopefully you know we find one and, and we tr you know sometimes we do we usually do so it's always i always say the go-to is to talk to the locals like, it that, is. like that's the yeah. person you want to talk it's to it's the best. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Go to, um, yeah, go. I mean, those ladies, they love to talk to anybody, you know, you can, in Portugal, it's not like, here. <laughs> it's not like here, you, um, here, nobody talks to each other. You know, if you're out with strangers, you don't really make conversation like in Portugal. I mean, you just step outside and everybody talks to you, you know, it's, I love it. I, it's just, I, that's what I love about Portugal too, is that like, I can go outside and, um, those I love the one thing I talk about with my family too is um those older ladies that generation like my mother's generation I hate seeing them go because they're getting to that age they're passing on and they have so much personality so much knowledge um like such a fire about them it's a different it's different it's different from the next generation that's coming up and I I'm gonna miss because I used to be able to walk out out of the you know, my house and I'd run into, you know, Senora Maria, Senora, you know, Fernanda, whatever. And, you know, I'd stop and talk to her and then, you know, she'd tell me something or whatever. And then now like those ladies, they're not, a lot of them are not there anymore, you know? And um, I mean, it was so, it's so funny in Portugal because you could go like, you're going to go visit somebody, say you're going to go visit somebody and they're not home. There's the old lady outside. Ah, oh, ah, yeah. Ella, Ella, see you. Ella, Java, Ella, for so You know what I mean? Like, oh, she just like they know everything about like that yeah, generation. Yeah. It's really it's disappearing, and um, I, I'll definitely, definitely miss that. Definitely miss that. You know, parts of Portugal that I'll definitely miss as time goes on. Yeah, to your point, one of my favorite stories. Uh, so when I visited Saint Michael, the my family's from the Azores. So yeah. When I visited Saint Michael, one of my favorite things, and I tell people the story all the time. Um, cause I always said, well, when someone says, what's the biggest difference? It's to me, it's, it's that what you just said. It's a sense of community. Yeah, it because is. Because the one thing I saw there that I've never seen here is that, you know, there was a, a kid, maybe uh, 10, 12 years old, knocking on the neighbor's door and would you know, say, do you have uh, some sugar we can borrow? Yes. Or, yes. or do you have some milk? And I'm like, I tell my people going, how many, how, I tell my buddies, my buddies. And I was like, how many of your neighbors do you know by first name? You don't. It's so sad. <laughs> I, know, I really, I know a few of them, but it's like, I really talk to them and they're like, 
those ladies, they'd be outside, you know, and there's jokes, you know, because it's like the security camera, they're at the window. And, <laughs> and this dude, they know everything. They they see if you're going out. And like, like I said, if you go visit somebody and they're not home, they're like, oh yeah, she'll be right back. She just went to pick up some coffee or, yeah. you know what I mean? Like they, they know that everybody's life. But um, it, it, it was just, it's just fun. It's fun when you walk, you know, through the streets and, and you can, you know, like half the people and they talk to you and they ask you how your parents are. And it's just, you know, it's very nice, but you're seeing that go away as these ladies pass yeah. on. And they're very strong ladies. I mean, being from uh, where I'm from, Figueiredo de Fage, the, the Peixetas, I don't know if you've seen any videos on the Peixetas. They, you know, there's some, some things about them that I've seen. And um, they're very um, comical women. They're very upfront. They'll just tell you whatever they're thinking. And um, they have a certain life about them that it's just, they're very strong women and um strong-minded and uh I, I love that generation i love my mother's generation you know i definitely um i'll definitely miss that because my mother's one of the last few ones standing like in her um yeah. in in her group of friends you know a lot of them have passed on and you know it's it's sad to see you know definitely. yeah it's definitely especially from a woman's perspective in portugal i mean i was just telling my buddy this i mean literally up until 1975 Portugal was under a dictatorship. And I mean, yes. you look at women literally had essentially no rights. Yes. And to your point, when you talk about being strong women to, to live through that. And then. Oh, yeah. yeah. My incredible. mother, for example, my mother, um, my mother didn't work in Portugal. Um, she, she tells me that my dad, not my dad, my grandfather, her father did not want her to work. He did not want her or my grandmother to work. Um, my my grandfather was a fisherman. He did, you know, he did okay. They weren't like rich. They weren't poor. They were comfortable. So they could stay home. Um, and he didn't want my mother to work. Even when my dad, when my mother got married, my parents lived within, my grandmother had a house, but it had like four or five apartments. So they lived in one of the little apartments and, um, my mother didn't work. She used to sew, do embroidery for people, but that was it. She didn't work outside of the house, but what's amazing. So you'd think when she comes to America, she would it would be hard for her. She came to America. She got her license within a couple of years. Um, she tells me that the day she went to get her license, it was her and two men. They had to go to Boston, I guess, to take the test. This was years ago, probably in the 60s. And um, she's the only one that passed. That's mind awesome. you, <laughs> Mind you, she did not speak very much English. She was learning as she was here. And she was a Portuguese woman, didn't have a car in Portugal. Um, I don't even know if she saw a car, but you know, I mean, at that time when she came to the sixties, yeah, yeah. there probably weren't too many cars. There was a few, but probably not too many people had them. And, uh, she came here and got her license within a couple of years. My dad didn't bother to get his license cause he was a fisherman. He was always out and she was the first one and she passed the test. She went with two other men and they failed. And then, um, she just came here and within, uh, a couple of years, she bought a four family in Gloucester. And then a few years later, she bought a one family here in New Bedford. And my mother managed all the money. My mother, my mother managed like everything. So it's just, when I think about that, like she grew up so protected in Portugal um, by her dad, from what she tells me. Um, and she came here and she hit the ground running and she's, and she's still tough. Like she's still, she's, she's a tough cookie. She's going to be yeah. 91 next month. You know? Wow. God bless her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I was curious about, because I'm reminiscing now, and then uh, yes. uh, where you're from, do they have, is, um, is, like in, in the Azores, almost every house has like that gate that everyone kind of like hangs out. It, it, are the villages like that too? See, where I'm from, it's different. Um, where I'm from in Boarch, we have the houses, it's kind of like the houses that are all attached. Okay. So there isn't the gates and you just have like the house and um, it's really cute because you walk in, there's like a little door you open, like a gate type thing. And you have like a courtyard in the middle. Like my grandmother had that and she had a well in the middle um, before, I guess they must not have had running water way back when the house was built. So she, yeah. and it was to wash clothes. She had the pia and she had the well. And I actually have a picture of my mother and my aunt and my sisters. My sisters were little and they have the pia with no running water, but the well there. And, you know, one person's, you know, got the bucket to pour the water. Um, so, but there's ladies, they would stand outside, you know, on the street, you know, like yeah, yeah. where my grandmother's street was. 
And so it's mostly like apartments or those houses. And then there's the vivendage, which is, um, those came a little bit later. And, you know, like people started building the vivendage when you go up to the Serra. And those have gates, but that's not where like the people hang out. The people hang out like more like where the houses are, just like those row houses that are all attached. But everyone just is out in the streets. You know what I mean? Because there's like the Tashka, like my grandmother's street, is uh, one of the very popular streets in, um, I say my grandmother's not, she was not alive anymore, but I always call it my grandmother's street. And uh, you know, they have like coffee shops. It's not a big street. They must have like three or four coffee shops. They have um, maybe three or four restaurants. And so there's always people, they have the shwanadas. Um, and then there's just people that come and stand outside. They actually uh, shut off the street to traffic now. So, um, but there's, there's always that activity and always people talking and something going on and everyone knowing your business pretty much, you know? So um, it's kind of funny, but that's Portugal. That's, you know, that's what it is. You know, the personalities. It's so funny. Cause when I went, it's sometimes, and it's weird. Cause like, I remember my first time in Portugal and someone could tell like whose family I was part of without it. Like, Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah, you then... to Maria? <laughs> <laughs> yeah like, they know. know that. <laughs> Exactly. And you don't know who they are and you're like, oh, you know. Yeah, I know. I know. It's true. Exactly. The same thing yeah. happens. I, know. I swear I'm convinced they have like their own FBI office. <laughs> oh, seriously. Are oh, they make good FBI detectives? That's for mm -hmm. sure. You know. So, yes. Um, so I, I want to get to your book, too. So what's um, tell us a little bit about how I know you mentioned you got interested in cooking uh, after you were married. What was the, the first step you took in the first recipe that you said, I'm definitely going to put this in, in this book? Um, let me see. Probably, um, I mean, one of the first ones I shared on Facebook, I think, uh, yeah, probably like the called Verde, probably the called Verde for sure, because I, I think everybody knows called Verde, either, yeah. either, like even if you're from the mainland or, um, the Azores, everyone knows called Verde. It's a favorite soup. And it's one of those that, I don't know, it seems like to stir up a lot of emotion in people and people, everyone seems to love that soup and it brings back memories. And uh, I think soups are a big part of the Portuguese home. Um, all of us know like that big pot of soup that would be in the kitchen and that you'd be eating for days. <laughs> like after like the third, the second day, like, okay, mom, I'm all set. I want to eat something. <laughs> my mother was big on soups and um, I always strive to make my soups taste like hers because I, I always, I did love her soups, but sometimes, you know, after a few days, I'm like, okay, you know, something else would be good. But um, it, it's an economical thing. And um, it's healthy. My mother would always tell me, oh, you know, the doctors were talking on the Portuguese channel, the, <laughs> You know, it's like, <laughs> they say the best thing to eat is a homemade soup with all the vegetables. Like she would tell me that all the time, you know, so she was big on that. And um, so I would have to say the, the caldo verde for sure. And also, and then probably the bacalhau mm -hmm. um, because that's one of my favorite dishes. Um, and that's one of the dishes that I love that my mother made. And also the cod, you know, we grew up eating a lot of cod sure. because my dad was a fisherman and um, he would salt his own cod at home, like I said. And um, so those are probably two of the, the first few and that I knew for sure. And honestly, when I was trying to come up with the, oh, and then of course the sardinha de sardes. Um, and that's what I went with in the cover of my book, the sardines. Yeah. And um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And uh, I had to, it was a struggle, like trying to think of what to put on the cover. It was either going to be like cod or a soup or the sardines. And um, because the cod and the sardines represent my dad. My dad, just on a little side note, he was a cod fisherman um, way, 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 way back. He started going fishing for cod when he was uh, 14 was his first trip. And um, it, the cod fishing way back then, they used to go away for six months. They mm -hmm. would leave the family. And his first trip, he went with his dad. And my mother, she remembered all these stories. So thank God she told me so many of these things. 
And I try to like, I like to talk about it because it keeps it in my mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And some things I've written down, but like, I wish I wrote down more. My dad used to tell us really exciting stories of things that would happen to him out fishing. And um, so he would leave the family for six months at a time and go out to like Greenland and Newfoundland and the Grand Banks. That's where they used to catch the cod. And then uh, they would come back. So then when he wasn't fishing from like April, May to like October, November, he would be away from my fam, from my mom. When he got married, he'd be away from my mom. So then the other months he would fish for sardines out of Figueira de Foch. So those are two very special, you know, things in Portuguese cuisine that mean a lot to me because that was the livelihood for my family. You know, um, that's how my father provided for my family. He, he went cod fishing and he went sardine fishing. So those were definitely, um, two choices that had to be, you know, on my cover. And I went with the sardines. Yeah, it has so much yeah. sentimental value to it. Yeah, um, it does. There was a documentary I saw, I wish I remember the name. It was like maybe like in the 60s, I want to say. Yeah, it was, yeah the port it's specifically Portugal, cod yes. fishermen. And watching it, you get like such a sense, at least for me, I had such a sense of pride. Yes. That, that was like, yeah. We did that. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I'm, I, that's why like, I'm very proud of that because it took a very, it takes a very special person to be able to do what those men did. Um, my dad, he did 23 of those trips for six months at a time. He left at first left his, his mom and his, you know, his siblings. Um, and then once he was married, he would leave my mom and her daughters for six months at a time. And you've seen the, the video, you see how they had the, I guess I would call it the mothership, the big ship. And then they used to go out in the little dories. Yeah. My dad used to tell us stories. Like he was a good storyteller when it came to the cod stories. Um, I wish I had documented them because he had really amazing stories. Yeah. And he, he said they would go out in the little dories. So mind you, you're in the middle of the Atlantic ocean, right? Um, in the middle of the ocean by yourself, nothing around you. So each man goes off to his own, try to catch as much cod as you could. My dad used to be proud telling me like he would fill up the boat as much as he could with all cod. And it would be with like a little line, you know, just a yeah, little yeah. line. And um, then he, you'd roll back. And sometimes he'd say, if say like a storm starts rolling in really quick, they'd start sounding an alarm on the boat. So the men would know also like well a horn so they could find because if it was fog they'd have to be able to find the ship through the horn the sound and also to warn them to come back and then he'd tell us some men would never make it back to the ship you know because the weather would change fast fortunately my dad always made it back but i can just imagine you know how sad um and hard that life was and um it's just i'm very proud of it because i don't think just any person like i joke no, you know with yeah, my kids yeah. i'm like these kids today they couldn't go out there no. at age 14 you know, there's, no there's way. no way, there's no way. And my dad, my grandfather actually got a medal of honor from the Salazar regime for oh, wow. saving a ship, a ship from one of the ships was sinking because they were caught in a storm out there. And, um, I believe it was out there and I wanted to find all the documentation with a story, but I only found the record of the actual medal, but it doesn't tell me the background, what happened. So I only know like bits and pieces from what my mother remembered. And apparently the, the boat was anchored, but the anchor was stuck. They couldn't loosen the anchor. And in a storm, um, if you can't loosen the anchor and get away, like you're gonna sink because the, the waves are gonna push you down. So um, he, I guess he tied a rope around himself and had a machete or something and he cut the anchor loose somehow. Wow. So he saved a ship full of men because in his mind, he was like, well, we're gonna die. If we stay anchored, yeah. we're just, just, we're gonna sink. This, we have no way out. So um, he said, I'm going to risk my life and try to loosen, get the anchor loose. And he was able to. So he came back and he got a Medal of Honor from the Salazar regime, which is pretty cool. It's pretty wow, cool. Wow, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. So I'm very proud of, like, that was my father's father. Yeah, I'm very proud. So that's why when it comes to, like, seafood and fish and, you know, like, for me, it's, it's got a very sentimental value for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to your point, so I, I feel like most people wouldn't think about this, but one of the biggest struggles with those cod fishermen is that if you were getting paid per whatever it was, kilo at that time, yes. uh, or however they did it, your biggest worry was how, you know, everyone wants to make a lot of money, right? 
But if you right. fill up your dory too much, I and know, yes. and anything happens, yeah. see you later, you know? Exactly, exactly. So it's it's a catch-22, you know? And yeah. if anyone if anyone has, like, a family member that was a card fisherman, there's actually, I don't know the name of the website off the top of my head, but there's a museum in Ilivu, um, a cod museum, cod fishing museum, and they have a database online that you can, I can put my dad's name, and I see all the trips that he made. Wow. The boats that he was on, the companions, like his mate is his mates on those trips. Um, and it tells me how many kilos he caught. That's amazing. Caught. It's so cool. And it has his picture on there. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So if wow. anyone has any family member that ever fished the cod, if you check out the just Google like the the Ilivu Cod uh, Museum and there's a database on there. I've shared it on my page. I gotta share it okay. again. But um it's pretty cool. I found my grandfather on there. I found my dad, um, some other family friends that are there. So it's it's pretty amazing that they have all of that, all of that recorded on there, you know, and it's all there at your fingertips. Yeah. And, and to your point, too, it's like to talk about like the newer generation. It's like I'll go fishing out of Cape Cod and even like we're in a boat almost 30 feet, actually 30, 32 or something like that. And even in some weather, I'm like, guys, I don't think this is. Oh, uh, no, I and never, know. And never mind what they were going through in those uh, the dories. It's just like oh, sometimes geez. even us, because we'll always check the weather. And, you know, we never we always say if, if, if there's a possibility, we don't even bother because who wants to get stuck out there during that? But I can't even imagine. I mean, this is a, a newer boat that we're in. Never right, mind, right. Never mind what they were using back then. Oh, I know. My dad, one of them, one of the boats that he was on was actually a sailboat still. It didn't even wow. have a motor. So my mother, there's another story. My mother has like, they have a wealth of stories. It's so awesome. Um, you know, like there was, the only way you could communicate back then, there was actually a, a hospital ship and a communication ship called Gilienge. It's actually docked um, and it's a museum in Vienna the Castello right now. So that's how they would communicate back. Um, one year, my dad was on that boat that was still like with a sailboat. It didn't have a motor. And they stopped in the Azores. So he was able to communicate back home. I think what they, they used to have, I think it was called the Casa de Pescadores um, in Blarch. And then like the family would go there and that's where you could call and oh, okay. talk to a family member. I think that's how it was. So he called home and said to my mom, look, I'm going to be home within this amount of days. So, um, but what happened was, I guess there was no wind. So the boat uh. took a lot longer to get back home. Well, my mother, you know, she did the bedroom all nice, you know, the sheets, the new comforter, whatever. And then like the boat didn't come and the families were worried. They thought the boat had sank because they didn't hear from them. The boat didn't arrive on the day. So my mother said, ever since then, when my dad called saying like he was going to be home, on the, he, she, she didn't, didn't change anything like in the, <laughs> in the bedroom because <laughs> she felt like she jinxed it, you know, she jinxed yeah. it because, you know, she was all ready for him to arrive on that day. And then like, because they had no wind. Uh, they were very delayed, you know, so um, it's just stories like that. Like, I love those stories. You know, I kind of wish I could like go back in time yeah. and uh, see what it was like, you know, like back then. So it was pretty cool. And the difference is an Azorian and woman would have been like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> We've been all this time. <laughs> I know. Yeah, right? That's so funny. No, my mother's uh, very calm. My mother for a Portuguese woman, she's extremely calm. My mother's a very calm um, she's definitely not, she's not one of those in your business people. My mother's like, kind of like different. Yeah. She's definitely kind of stay in your own lane kind of person. You know what I mean? I'm kind of like that too. You know, I kind of just do my thing and that's it, you know? Yeah. But yeah. to your point, I, I, and I've noticed the same thing that when I visit Portuguese people are such great storytellers, like to oh, tell yeah. stories because yes. people, people don't realize it's not easy to tell a story and, oh like, no, and I think it just comes natural to, Mm -hmm. Portuguese people because every time you know we'll sit at a cafe and and there's always yeah. like I'm always talking to my uncle I'm like I think he's exaggerating a little <laughs> <laughs> you know but it, it they're just such great storytellers they um, do yeah they had so many I don't know I mean it seemed like life they had so many like things going on and things to tell you about back then you know like yeah. my mother's stories I now she's 91 she her memory's going so I kind of I'm going to miss hearing those stories, you know, but she, every chance that she had, she would love, she remembered so much. She would love to tell us all these things, you know, 
and even stuff related to my, you know, dad and, you know, things like that. But my dad, when he was alive, he would love to tell us like his cod fishing, you know, experiences. It was yeah, fun to hear. I, I always yeah. joke that there's always uh yeah, a Tigamant guy. There's always like that Antigamant, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Antigamant. Antigamant. I know. Antigamant. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I know. I so how, how did, um, cause I'm always in, and you know, what's cool too about that. You took all the pictures of I all took the every meals picture. in your, in your book. Yes, I did. And believe it or not, it was with my iPhone. I didn't even have a professional camera. Yeah. yeah. I tell people all the time, cause I have buddies in photography and filmmaking and I'm telling them yes. well, the iPhone nowadays, yeah. the image quality yeah. is, and it's, you can even get those adapters and stuff like right, that. To, right. Right. It's right. crazy. It's just um, at night, the iPhone is still not good, but um, during yeah, the day, yeah. the pictures are great. I wasn't sure I was, you know, I sent it off to the um, the company that put the book together for me. And I was like, oh, I don't know if these pictures are going to be good. And I was, I was going to be in trouble. Obviously I was going to have to retake and redo all those sure. meals, but no, they, they came out fine. I'm like, thank goodness. Even the cover <laughs> photo was like my iPhone, yeah. you know, on my kitchen yeah. table. So how, um, how, how, did the, how did the title come about for the love of Portuguese food? You know, it's very strange because it was, it's the name of my um, Facebook page. And honestly, I wanted to start this page. And it's funny because I set up the page, I think like in November of 2012, but I didn't start posting anything. And I think I called it like the Portuguese kitchen, which is so generic, right? So, but I didn't start the page until January, really like posting stuff. And, um, I think that just popped into my head one day, like all of a sudden, you know, how so, sometimes like you're like laying in bed and something just pops yeah. into your mind. It was probably something like that. Like, I don't even know. It just like magically popped into my head and I'm like, Oh, I like that name. And I went with it. And so I wanted to match the name obviously of my Facebook page to the book. And that's how, but there was, there's not no story behind it. It was literally like a light that went off in yeah. my head, you know, cause I had a very generic name for my page, which I didn't like it, but I think I just, named it that just to get it started and sure. see if I could motivate myself. But I was like, I don't want this name. It's too generic, you know? So yeah. um, I'm glad I thought of something else, you know? So. Yeah, but that's a great point though. Cause I always tell people uh, in art, whether it be comedy or writing, anytime you have an idea to write it down because the minute yeah. you say, Oh, I'll remember that. I'm like, dude, you're not going to remember. No, that. no, no, no. <laughs> I, I fool myself all the time. I fool myself all the time. I say, I want to remember that. And I don't, I forget. I forget stuff all the time. Yeah. Like going to the grocery store, you know, I'm like, I'll remember that. It's only four things. And then I come out and I forgot like half the stuff, you know? So yeah, well, it's like um, even, I mean, grocery store, I go to the grocery store with a list and I come back with 50 things that weren't on that list anyway. So oh, I know. <laughs> Me, I make the list and then I leave the list at home. That's yeah. my problem. <laughs> But yeah. anytime I say I'm just gonna go grab milk, it's never just milk. Yeah. Oh, I know, I know. Because then you start walking around, and then it's like, oh, look at that. I'm I'm the same way. It's yeah. terrible. It's like, oh, I'll take five pounds of cod and five pounds of salmon. <laughs> yeah, like, you sure? like, yeah, throw it on there. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. so obviously, all these meals are absolutely incredible. I think one of the favorites that I was looking at the other day is the actually there was two. Where's the other one? Uh, oh, here it is. Um, you did the chicken stew and peas. Yeah, and that one's delicious. The one with the peas, that yeah. one is fabulous. Yeah, people this love one. that one. That one's very popular. That one's very yeah. very popular. It reminds mm -hmm. me because the because I um, it reminds me of the dish. Uh, what's it called? Edvidish, right? When like, yes, with the it's egg. The same, yeah, it's there's so many variations like with the edvidish and then yeah. the linguis and stuff, but that one specifically it's called the jardineta because okay. it's got you know the when you put like a more involved like with the yeah. the carrots and the potatoes and that's and the peas and that becomes a jardineta that's what that's what we would in the mainland yeah. refer to that you know and um but it's there's so many variations of of that you know like oh, some yeah. people use like little cubes of pork or beef yeah. or you know I like it with the chicken. My daughter loves that. Every once in a while, she's like, mom, you got to make that stew with the peas and the chicken. She's my little one. She loves that dish. It's really good. I love it. Yeah, I, I do. Cause I always liked the village, but I was never the big on the egg part, to be honest. So mm. I, I always like, I love this, but I don't have the egg. So the other day, yes. probably I don't know, the other day, it's probably like a month, month and a half ago already. Um, cause I'm always, I'm always tell people anything you make, you can always interchange something. Exactly. In the 
make it the way you like it. Yeah. 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 My husband doesn't like the egg, the obshkalfach yeah. either. I yeah. love it. I love the egg, um, but he doesn't like it. So I hardly put it in, in my food, you know? Yeah. But I even sure. love that the egg in my kanja. My mother would always do that. She'd yeah, always yeah, drop yeah. it in the kanja. I like that. Yeah. And, and what I did was, so instead of the egg, it was pretty similar to your stew, but I would put um, oh. chicken wings. I do. I toss Ooh, in yeah. chicken wings yeah. because yeah. if you cook it nice and low, uh, you know, nice and low for a long time, and that meat just falls off. Oh, the it bones. falls like, off. Oh. That that's what happens with with that. Like I like to use the the thighs for mm -hmm. that too, and it does. It starts to kind of like shred. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like that. It's delicious. It's so good. Yeah. I always tell people, I go, that's when you know it's done. Like, you'll put the fork, I, see if it's I know. Up, take it out, it's done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And the other one I really like here is um, the feijoada that, that you do. Oh my gosh. I made that the dish. other day. Did that you? is honestly, like after probably the cod sardines or right up there, that's my other favorite meal of all time. Yeah, that I'll tell you a little story about that. Um, yeah. I, um, well, I don't like, I don't like the um, dubra, dubrada, you know, mm -hmm. dubrada is basically a feijoada, but with the tripe in it. I don't like tripe. And my sister, um, my sister that passed away, um, she used to make the best dubrada that I know. And um, so one day I was already married and I wanted to make that dish, but um, I wanted to make it like hers because she made the best. Her, that sauce with those beans and that meat in it, it's like, it's incredible. So I called her up and I said, Linda, you know, how do you make your uh, lubrada? But I wasn't gonna put the tripe in it. So she jotted it down. I actually have a little piece of paper, you know, it says the beans, the tomato paste, the tomatoes, the, you know, the ham hock. And that's how I got the recipe from her. Like there was like no measurements, there was nothing, yeah, you know? Yeah, and yeah. then I just, I just did it. And then, I don't know, it came out like hers. And I'm like, uh, so that's one of my, Favorite meals to cook and favorite meals to eat because um, the sauce is just, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's absolutely yeah. delicious. I recommend, I definitely recommend trying that one for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, to your point, because when I, when I would do my cooking segments, I say the same thing. It's just tell me the ingredients because everyone yes. cooks different, right? And I always it's tell true. people, I do it as a joke, but it's a hundred percent true. Like I'll say, you know, you like a lot of garlic, put it out. You know, like a <laughs> But it's true because if you like a lot of onions or a lot of garlic, then put a lot. It, it but, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like you just need to know, you know, more or less how it is. And then you tailor it to your taste. Everyone has different tastes. You know, that's what makes people interesting. If we liked all the yeah. same things the same way, life would be boring. Right. So yeah. you can start with a recipe or add something else to it if you want, or leave something out if you don't like it. You know what I mean? But it's yeah. good to have that base and then you, you make it your own. And that's what I say. The good thing about like, cooking is you can make it your own you know if exactly. you make it at home you make it the way you like it you know yeah so that's that's what I like about cooking at home definitely. what was your your first meal you cooked on your own that you were like whoa I did it like one of those um it's well probably one of the first meals that I did on my own to be honest because I moved out of my parents house a few times when I was working in Boston I lived in Quincy then I lived in Norwood but I always moved back home and one thing I used to love to make was uh, fajon guisado. It goes back to the, sure. the beans, but it's the red bean stew. My parents would do, it's very simple. Um, just the linguisa, you know, with the onions, garlic, tomato paste. My mother loved using tomato paste um, and um, the water and then um, the beans. And um, you stew it and you let that like, so I used to like to let it stew for a long time. And then it um, would, you can have it with just a salad or with, um, with rice or even just like that by itself is it's a meal. Cause my mom would make it. My sisters used to make it. And um, I, even my dad used to cook that and it was wonderful. So um, that was probably, that was, I think one of the first meals that I made that I was like really proud, like, this is good. And uh, my roommate used to love that dish when I would make it. She would like ask me to make it all the time. So that's yeah. probably the There's a, uh, and I think to your point too, it's, I always tell people it's, it's not as hard, I think, or as challenging as, some people make it sound, you know what I mean? Like cooking no, in general. Cooking, no, it's simple. It's very yeah. simple. Yeah. So it's funny because I always said that. And then I, uh, <laughs> I made, I made his sushi to come out on once. And I'm like, I'm, just going, I'm like, I'm just going to the bakery next time to buy these. <laughs> oh, it's so much, 
I'm I'm like that too. When it see when it comes to um frying, yeah. like those are a lot. Like those yeah. are a lot of work. Nothing starts coming out. But they're actually not that hard to make. It's just Correct, a yeah. lot of work. It's, it's tedious. It's, not, it's tedious work. Yeah. Um, it's like the type of thing that's nice to do with someone else. Yes, right. 100%. Alone, it's a lot of work for one person. But when I made them, I've only made them twice, and I had my daughters help me. You know, like doing the cutouts and folding, yeah. and um, because it, it is, especially if we have like good bakeries around here, it's like yeah. bread, right? I yeah, have exactly. like, like we have so many places that make like great pop six. So it's like, why am I going to be making pop six? So once in a while, like you might make a bread at home, but, and honestly, I'd rather not have one bread at home because it's deadly. Like for me, <laughs> like that's, like, that's like my Achilles heel, you know, right there, that and French fries. Um, yeah. I can't not eat it. So I don't like to make bread at home and we're lucky to have so many great, um, bakeries around here, but, um, yeah, definitely though. It's, it's yeah, it was funny. Cause I, I did it. Cause people kept asking, can you make a video of this? So I was like, okay, I'm making it. I'm just like in the video. I even say, "Go, I made it for the people." Never That's again. It. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And then the frying. I don't like to fry because it it makes a mess. Then you get that fried smell in the house, um, and I it's just not healthy to fry. So I really avoid fry making a lot of fried foods. It's very rare to make fried stuff at home. So risage, I've only made once. I'd like to try and make it a few more times to to get it like just how I like it, just to prove to myself that I can make them the way I like. Yeah. My daughters love them when I made them, you know, but um, there's a few things I still like to tweak. I didn't, that recipe didn't get into the book because that's the other thing. I, um, when I was working on deciding what recipes to put into the book, it, I was constantly like working on my page and getting new recipes out there. But to work on the book, I had to have a cutoff. Like mm -hmm. just because I worked on a new recipe, I can't throw it in, into the book anymore because yeah. I had to send the manuscript off to the, the I'm self-published, but like I had a publisher format it, but I'm self-published, you know, they just did the formatting and I had to send it off to them, but I couldn't send changes. Like the, that was it. The manuscript was the manuscript. Yeah. So I couldn't, even though I worked on more recipes, I couldn't get them into the book. And then the other thing is I put a lot of pictures in my book and it's all color. Printing in color is very, very expensive. Uh, so like each page that you add to the book adds to the cost of printing the book. And then that means I have to charge more money and I didn't want my book to get too expensive. So, you know, I had to make a cutoff. So I don't know, you know, maybe someday I'll put another book together because there's some recipes I wish I had gotten in there. Like the research coming out was definitely one. Um, yeah, yeah. There's some that didn't make it in there because I didn't want the book to get too big. And I also had to do a cutoff so um but I, it's a good it's a good start for people you know that want to um get started cooking some traditional portuguese food one of um there's some great even hushdus is in here i mean and you also oh, uh, you also yes. break it down even putting like the nice portuguese translation too for them i like to is, do that so yeah people know yeah. what it's called in portuguese i think it's important the hushdus recipe um i know you've definitely eaten a hushdus before yeah. but I um I would ask you to try it. Try that recipe. Um, because that is it's done in a way that um it's uh, it's time consuming, it's more work, that recipe, but it's totally worth it in the end. I honestly of every recipe in my book, that's the recipe I've gotten the most compliments on. And you'd think a horse is basic, right? Like, why would that stand out? I've had people tell me it's better than their mother-in-law's, uh, better than their mothers, and that they make it over their mothers. That's dangerous to say. I'm That's not dangerous. lying. I know. And I've had women tell me that their husbands told them it's better than their own mothers. Um, and then I had a lady tell me the other day that it's the only ahojlos she'll make now, like that recipe. Wow. So because it comes out really creamy because the milk is heated, um, like you bring it to a, almost boil, and then you you're cooking the rice in another pan and then you're slowly adding the milk that stays warm like spoonful by spoonful and you're mixing it and like you're letting it like get like thicken a little bit before you add the next batch of milk and it just ends up so creamy and delicious and then the other thing is it doesn't take eggs and i've had people say this is not traditional because it doesn't take yeah. eggs it is there's traditional yeah, um, 
Yeah, my the my region of Portugal, we don't put eggs, the egg yolks, into our arroz dos. And um, I can only guess that maybe because they were fishermen and not farmers. I figure because where my husband's from, Serra de Estrela, my sister-in-law puts eggs in hers. But you figure they were farmers, right? They had chickens. Uh, they probably threw an egg in there. If you're a fisherman, you don't have chicken. You're not going to probably go buy yeah. an egg just to put in your arroz dos. You're just like, oh, I'm just not going to. That's what I think. I don't know for sure, but yeah, I'm guessing. Makes sense. That's probably one of the reasons. So we do not put eggs in our um, arroz dos. And I, I absolutely love that one. The uh, <laughs> I'd get, when I would do a cooking show, I'd get comments like, you know, just, just to your point when it's like, oh, you didn't put this. So then I yeah. just started, I just started adding Juan Cagón teaches how to make this a suamanada my way. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah there's so, so many regional differences. It's, I didn't even realize how many regional differences there were until I started doing this because then people are like, oh, I put this, I put that. I put, and I was like, wow, I didn't realize because Portugal is so small, but every little region does something a little bit different. And the other thing that's really, really shocking is um, the number of pastries that we have. Yeah. It's, I mean, I've gone to Portugal I, for like 30 something times, probably in my mm -hmm. life, close to 40. And I haven't even tried like, probably a fraction of all the pastries that are there. Cause yeah, every time yeah. I go somewhere, like I find out, like we went to a place in Lausanne, Talajnal, and there's a lot of chestnut trees there. And I had to go and have my coffee and my dessert. Cause that's what I do when I go somewhere. I don't even care so much about eating half the time. I just want to have my coffee and like a sweet, like that's more important to me, honestly. Like I love that. I just love that feeling of, um, I don't know. I have that coffee break thing in me that, it just bring me a lot of joy. So uh, that's what we did there. And um, and they had a traditional sweet there that um, I think it was called Utadinho and it was a chestnut pastry and it was so delicious. And then we also went to Amarant. Amarant has five or six, usually there's one or two per village or town. They have like five or six traditional pastries from there. Wow. Um, I tried only one. I mean, you know, cause it's, it's just, you're not going to go there and have like six different pastries, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, but each region has each town, region, village, a lot of them have their own pastry. So there's always new ones to discover. Definitely. Beyond the pastel nata, you know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody I was, was going to ask you, when you went to Portugal, it's something I've never been, I never had the chance to do. Uh, did you get to go to uh, the pastel blam? Did you get to try that big fat, oh, yeah. big place over there? many times I went I went for the first time back in the 90s when me and my friends used to go and we used to just explore like the thing is I've been to places and some I probably forget because I didn't pay as much attention um, but I know we went to blank and my friend I and I remember telling my friend I was like oh you know when we went to blank I remember we went there and we had the pastel blank and and I remember we we brought them because it comes in that little container mm -hmm. um but we didn't eat them there. And I'm like, I don't remember going in the back. And like she said that, the, cause if you walk in there, literally it took me years to actually walk inside. It's a maze in there. It's a maze of blue tiled rooms and it's beautiful. And you can sit there and have your one for self blank and you can't have just one. When you eat it there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you cannot have just one. Like you can't, when it's warm out of the oven, you absolutely, you can't. Like I have friends that have gone there and they've eaten five or six at a time. <laughs> <laughs> they're that good and the funny thing is like there's usually a long line it does move fast and it's the whole experience it's not just about the pastel it's the experience like you're in line you have people with their cameras they're like snapping pictures like this because it's just like there's crowds and then like there's people like they're bringing out hundreds of pastels like fresh out of the oven and then like they're packing them up to go and then it's beautiful the building is is very historic very beautiful and then you walk in and it's all blue tiled rooms um it's like a maze though, like the rooms in there. And I, I love it. I, we go all the time. And now the last time I went, we went at night. Oh, my husband, um, we sat outside in a courtyard. Um, they opened a little courtyard in the middle and that's the first time we got to sit out there. That was, I think the first year they opened that part. They didn't have that before. And, um, so we were the last people to, to, to be there, to, to leave a push lady of the blank. I never went that late. It was like, 12 30 I think when we left and there was like the security guard was locking up so we all walked out but my husband went to the bathroom well he almost got locked in there <laughs> the guy locked the door and he That's closed hard. all the lights and my husband was 
still like walking out. So I'm like, oh my God, that wouldn't be too bad getting stuck and pushed Lydia the blank. Right. <laughs> but um, that was fun. So I've been there. I try to go the last few years. I've tried to go to different areas, but we always used to go to Blaine and I, I couldn't leave without having my first level blame. But now like, you know, we've been going to the Husiyu, all the Shiadu, um, just to see a few different, cause I, I'm like a creature of habit. I tend to do and eat the same, like go to the same places. And, you know, I'm like, Lisbon has so much to see that, you know, like last year I decided to go to Caix Sudre, which mm -hmm. I had not been to in since the 90s and it's very different we went to the timeout market we went to pink street and i'm like why don't i come here more often because i always go to the same places because i was always going to blay and then i always started going to the husiu i'm like now i want to come to kaj because i want to see what's in you know kaj sudre and that was my plan last year i was going to go um back to kaj and discover the new things there but obviously because of covid you know we didn't go yeah. so that's not at the top of my list to go back and discover yeah. that and, and it's always like every time i see a video on social media like the, they saw one the other day about centra and oh uh, my gosh we spent a night there the last time we were in portugal it seems is it as is, beautiful as the videos it's more beautiful like yeah. honestly like yeah centra for me it's one of the most beautiful places definitely in portugal if you look in the back of my book i list the top 10 places centra is one of the top um centra is like see that it's like opening up a fairy tale and like walking into it like it the greenery the mansions the palaces um it's just it's magical it's absolutely incredible i every time i go to portugal i have to go to Sintra, but we have family that lives like 20 minutes away and um the thing is too like my husband and i we always take the drive to Sintra because his sister lives in Odivelas, which is 20 minutes away. So, and we go visit, you know, a palace. Um, we we'll go to Monserrat, we go to um, uh, Pena Palace, or, you know, um, Quinta da Hagaleta. There's always somewhere to go. And then we wanna go have coffee, of course, cause that's what I wanna do, right? And we can never find a parking space downtown. It's impossible, we drive and drive. And then the thing is there's one ways. And then once you get on a road, you can't turn back. You have to go all the way around. So we always get discouraged. We're like, all right, Let's just leave. We end up in Kashkaj or back in Lisbon. So I said, look, I want to spend a night in Sintra so we can go have coffee and a travsaidu because I wanted to go have the traditional pastry of Sintra in Sintra. You know, they have the travsaidu and they have the kajal at Sintra. They're both delicious. So um, we stayed in Sintra overnight at a beautiful hotel. And, you know, the downtown completely clears out like late afternoon. Really? Completely clears out late afternoon. There was almost nobody down and we almost didn't make it in time to the pastry shop um the pirikita is where they have the the traditional pastries the famous one and uh they were about to close we had like 10 minutes to have the coffee and the pastry and then the downtown was like closing up and like so like dead i couldn't believe it but during the day it's it's a madhouse but people just go for the day and yeah. then they leave so um I recommend staying overnight in Sintra because it's it's magical, it's beautiful. And then like a lot of people leave at night. So you have like <laughs> everything to yourself. I mean, the palaces are closed by then, yeah. but um, it's still nice to be there and, and walk along the streets. I love it, I love it. But I recommend it. If you go, definitely, definitely go check yeah, it out. For sure. Yeah, yeah, one of these days I have to take another trip to, I, I, I always say I need to take a trip to sightsee because it's always, you're at this family's yeah. house, this family's well, house. Well, that's the thing. I've had family tell me like, I don't have that much family. so. We kind of luck out and also when we go there like we kind of just like do our own thing anyways um yeah, yeah. i try to fit in family but i also you know like it it's expensive to go to push a lot of time you rent the car the flights and you know so i'm like i want to go see stuff i don't want to just be sitting in somebody's house all day you know so um i try to limit that and um so we can get a vacation out of it because that's usually our only vacation all year so i want to make sure i do you know get to go places and um but yeah i find that people um have the same problem like they want to see their family but then they want to sightsee so i've had people say like oh, i'm gonna go to the Azores, but i'm not gonna tell my family that i'm there you know what I mean? <laughs> they'll find out they'll find yeah, out yeah i know with facebook now you can't keep it a secret you know yeah but i understand uh, though it's hard it's very hard I said, it, would, it would be nice if uh like a trip for me the ideal would be like get the sightsee and like, the last day it's just like a major cookout with everybody yes. there you know what i yes. mean so it's like yes. there you go there's the trip because yeah, yeah. You know, i went to st michael and we did that it was house to house and then afterwards i'm like 
I didn't even see, there's so much history here. I didn't get to see much. So when I went yeah. back the second time, I told my uncle, and, uh, my my great uncle, and then I, uh, he goes, all right, we'll, we'll go. So we went, we saw, we got to. Yeah, you, you know, got to see, see that stuff. Uh, yeah, you don't want to just go and like be in somebody's backyard, like your whole vacation yeah. or house. Yeah. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. I like that. I love the food with everyone hanging out at the dinner table, but there's so much history. I don't want to look back and say, I never. Got yeah. It's like you've been to history. Portugal a hundred times, but you never saw it anything yeah. right like you don't want it to be like that we do a mix we do um because we go for like three and a half weeks so we we go to our place in figueda and then um you know we see family a little bit and then we take off like we take off like on little side trips um and then sometimes we go to his, his family's area um and spend the most i can spend there is like two or three days because it's like <laughs> it's a little village with like nothing with like 80 people yeah. it's nice but there's not but there's a lot of beautiful uh towns around there that we go visit we take a ride and we go see um like Linyaj is very pretty Govaya, the set of the still region is very pretty but his town is literally like just there's nothing there like there's nothing to do you know what i mean yeah, yeah. so you can only be there where like in figueda I can just leave my house at any time and I'm at a cafe, at a restaurant, at the beach. And, you know, like his town, I need a car to go anywhere to see anything or be able to do anything, you know? So, um, but then, then my sister in law is in Lisbon. So we get to spend a couple of days in Lisbon before we leave. So, um, you know, we do a little bit of the family and a little bit of the sightseeing. And sometimes we take a, a little trip without the kids because the, they want to stay with the aunts. And then, you know, we just get to do our own thing. And other times the kids come with us. So, it's a, it's a nice mix of everything, you know? Yeah. Uh, I have a couple more questions and I'll let you go. Um, yeah. Because like, as you mentioned earlier, the different regional uh, foods, uh, one of my favorites, to, I finally ended up making it in person and then it was deadly because it's just so fresh. But Whoa. I'm a big Malasalish fan. I'm a big oh, Malasalish okay. fan. Yes, yes. And I'm wondering, because I know everyone everywhere is different with their what they call it, what they make it. Where you're from, are Malasalish made or no? No, we don't have malasadas. No, okay. no, we do have something called fidoz, but mm -hmm. it's not. Um, Is it it's the not, donut ones? It's it's the ones that are the little balls okay. out of like butternut squash or pumpkin. Okay, um, that's what my mother would make because she would make it at Christmas. She calls them fidoz, and um, they she would make them with butternut. I could still smell them because <laughs> well, she had them in the big like thing like rising, and I could still smell that butternut squash like with the sugar. Oh, it was so good. Um, that's what we have in my region okay. and um in most of uh the mainland if you travel around the mainland you don't see that um i know one area where they are popular something very mm -hmm. similar and they do call them fidoz, is the Serra de Estrela region my sister-in-law does make those um but i don't know uh, i'm not off the top of my head i don't know of any yeah, other region yeah, yeah. that has that type of fidoz. They, they're usually different yeah. yeah it's weird and it's like the same name but they it's something totally yeah. different yeah, you won't find a Malasada in Figueira de Foz. <laughs> yeah, it's like Joao Cagan says, same thing, only different. Same you thing. Know, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, what's interesting is I say Malasada and Treseira, they say Filoche, but it's exactly the same. I know, they just changed the name. Yeah, yeah. they just changed the name. It's true. And then Hawaii <laughs> is, is like a donut filled. Yeah, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different. I know. I don't know if that's like Madeira influence or not. Maybe yeah. you think. Um, so a couple more questions, and I'll let you go. I know you're busy. Mm -hmm. And then obviously your book. I'm gonna put the link and everything like that, so people can. Um, Thank you. Get to it and everything. Yeah. So uh, I'll leave you with one last question. You're having a big dinner at your house. You can invite three people from history. Could be people who have passed, people alive. Who are the three people you would invite, and what would be the entree for the day? um can it be does it have to be somebody famous or nope it can three individuals can be people who passed alive yes uh, the three and three people then what would be the dish you'd have served it would be um my grandfather my father's dad because i've never met him and he's the one that got that medal of honor and yep. um i would like to um meet him for sure um probably i'd like my dad um and my sister and it definitely would be a cod dish that's for sure. awesome <laughs> uh, yeah. what's your favorite card cod dish that you do it's it's 
between bacalhau gomsa or bacalhau alagareiro because I love batata muru as well. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a toss up between those. Yeah. I love both of them. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, it would have to be between those two. We did, a, I did a Facebook Live right before this and we were talking, someone asked, and they said, what was your favorite recipe to cook? And one of mine is bacalhau cum sublada. And I, oh, and yes. I, told, and I yes. told them, I go, you can, if you want to have steak with the, uh, with the sublada, you can do that too. Like yeah. You can just switch yeah. it with any type of meat. Exactly. Yeah, it goes with everything. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so, hey, yeah. I want to thank you again for coming on the Juan Cagong show. The, we'll have, uh, this will be a premiere, so it'll be almost like Facebook Live, but it's a premiere, obviously. Um, oh, awesome. So. I, I want to thank you again for coming on. It's been a it's a pleasure. And it's then obviously, everyone, this is the book. I was yeah, and hold on as the background. Hold on. I gotta get I have my awesome <laughs> I love Portugal shirt. I can't wait to wear this. That's awesome. <laughs> One day thank if Portugal you. comes, this is gonna be my shirt. I'll be wearing it all the summer in the summer. So yeah. see that? <laughs> what's your what's what's where can they get this? That's my Juan Cagón store. So on Etsy, yeah. it's just the, the link on I Etsy. Have. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's cool. I couldn't remember. Yeah, so yeah. Awesome. No, it, it was nice. We started we started the comedy, then we started doing some apparel stuff, and yeah, I had certain phrases I use. So I figured we would toss some uh, yeah on shirts and whatnot. So yeah, there's so uh, many possibilities now. You know. Yeah, but to, oh, that's one thing I wanted to mention. But to your point, because uh, when you said you started on social media. I think it's such a great idea for anyone considering literally any type of art, if you will, whether yes. it's food, music, putting on social media and just seeing how it grows because it is going to grow. Oh, yeah, exactly. exactly. I mean, I didn't think there was this much interest. Uh, for, I mean, I knew there was a little bit um, for Portuguese food, but honestly, like even from when I started to now, Portugal interest in Portugal itself has yeah. exploded. Um, 10 years ago, nobody thought of going to Portugal, unless you were Portuguese, Portuguese mm -hmm. descent. Most people, and Europeans, there are Europeans that like Portugal, you know, like the British, um, the Dutch, like we see a lot of them there. Um, even the, well, the French used to go a lot. They stopped going now that they're, the, they're going a lot too. Um, and you see a lot of Spanish, but the Americans, like they wouldn't think of going to Portugal. And now like so many want to go there. And I honestly think like social media is what made Portugal um, yeah. we'll put Portugal in front of people's eyes because I think they had um, a certain image of Portugal um, in their minds. It's like the old Portugal. They didn't realize Portugal is very modern. Like Portugal yeah. is leaps and bounds ahead of us, like in thinking, um, even in um, fashion and furniture and apartments, like uh, buildings, you see like ultra building, like ultra modern things there, you know? And um, I think people didn't like imagine. And then there's the old Portugal, which is absolutely sure. beautiful and priceless. You know, it's so valuable. And um, but I think now, like with Instagram and Facebook and people posting pictures, they're like, oh, my goodness. They're like, I didn't know that's what Portugal looked like, you know. Yeah. And uh, so it's 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 so much more popular than it was just a few years ago, you know. So absolutely. but this COVID thing, this COVID thing messed things up as far as like the yeah. tourism records that they were breaking. But hopefully, you know, things will rebound again once, you know, things are a little bit more normal. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Cause la last year, I told myself in January, I was like, I'm going to go vacation because it's like, I always work. I never take time off. Oh. And then I, was, I was like, this summer, this summer I'm going. And then uh, that was in January. And then February, March rolled around. I'm like, okay, it's not, it. it's not this year. No I know. I booked my trip, I think, in December of 19, 2019, I think I usually book like November, December, sometimes it goes into January for July. Cause we always go like, like third week of July, more or less in, into August. And, um, but then COVID hit and then my passport expired. My daughter's passports expired. They shut down all the passport agencies. So there was no way even top canceled my flight. So that was, I was waiting for that. I didn't cancel it myself. I was like, I couldn't bring myself to cancel it. Yeah, but I was yeah. like, if they cancel it, then I, I take that as my sign. I'm not going to sure. reschedule. But even if I wanted to reschedule, I couldn't because I didn't have a valid passport, you know. Yeah. So, um, but now I have our updated passports finally. But our 
Portuguese documents are expired. So it's like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. so I don't know. I don't know. Everything's up in the air, you know, so we'll see. Anywho, we'll see. Milana, thank you for joining us again yeah. for the Juan Cagón show. And then uh, we always end every show with, I always end all my videos the same at my closing. So we always say, uh, remember, Juan loves you. Je juge loves you. God bless. <laughs> God bless <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Nice talking thank you. to you. Paulo, Paulo, I always want to call you. <laughs> most, most people don't even know my real name. So that's I know, I that's know. right. Oh, no, I gave it away. Is that okay? <laughs> no, I don't, no worries at all. I always want to call you Juan. Well, like, it's my the, the it's natural easier. thing. I know, I know. People recognize me for it. Like, um, sometimes people just say, eh, eh Juan. Even they, <laughs> know my, they know my, my real name. And it's, they do, and they, they call you that. Yeah. yeah, and they see it. I'm like, dude, I'm like, it doesn't matter. I mean, I go, even even better, if you call me Juan, no one knows who I am. Anyway. I know, exactly. <laughs> anyway, thank right. you so well, thank much. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invite. Okay, bye-bye. Nice talking to you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.